All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's at nine o'clock right on the nose. We're going to go ahead and get started. I am Donna Prosser. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And we are so excited today to bring you a webinar talking about improving patient safety using Candor. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, as, as always, um, our monthly webinars carry one uh, continuing education credit hour for nurses, pharmacists, and physicians through MedStar Health. Um, you, if, you, if you designated yourself as either a, a nurse, a, a physician, or a pharmacist in the registration, you should receive an email from MedStar Health within the next week with an evaluation form and instructions on how you can collect your CE credit. The CE credit is only available for live webinars. Um, we will be recording this session. It will be available on our YouTube website uh, later on today or tomorrow, but um, only those who are here today will be eligible for that CE credit. As you can see here, uh, we none of our speakers and none of our planning committee members have any financial disclosures to report. And so I would like to turn it over to Dr. Dave Mayer, who is our CEO here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and he uh, will be moderating this session today. So welcome, Dave. Thanks, Donna. It's uh, great to be here, and welcome to the Patient Safety Movement's educational webinar series. Uh, this webinar series focuses on important concepts and issues related the safety of not only patients, but healthcare workers in the safety arena and healthcare arena. Today's discussion will be on CANDOR, which stands for Communication and Optimal Resolution After Preventable Medical Harm Occurs. Before we start, I would like to send our best wishes to Jack Gentry, who unfortunately will not be with us on the panel today. Jack has been dealing with some health issues, and we all send him our prayers for a speedy recovery. As you will see later in the program, Jack and Teresa, his wife, have been very active in promoting candor across the country and will share a video that will demonstrate some of their passion around this topic. We have a great panel for you today. Steve Burroughs will kick it off after I finish some introductory comments, followed by Tom Gallagher, then Carol Hemmelgarn, and then Marty Hatley will take us home before we open it up to some questions and and comments from the audience. Uh, each of the panelists has got a great CV, um, but I'll let them introduce themselves. So what is CANDOR? I like to say CANDOR is a comprehensive patient safety improvement program that has helped hospitals across the country reduce their preventable medical harm events. But you will also hear from this webinar that CANDOR has so many secondary benefits that come from a culture that embraces open and honest communication after harm is incurred. Unfortunately, preventable medical harm still occurs and too many hospitals put what Rosemary Gibson called a wall of silence up, as she noted in her book of the same title. In the medical malpractice community, that is known as deny and defend. Let's deny that the care was bad, even if the error was obvious, and let's defend it as hard as we can, even though we know an error led to the preventable harm. The CANDOR program is based on work done by pioneers like Rick Boothman while he was at University of Michigan, Tim McDonald while at the University of Illinois, Larry Smith at MedStar and a number of others, including Tom Gallagher, who we're delighted to have on our panel today with us. These efforts led President Obama in 2009 to put $25 million into demonstration grant research around an open and honest program related to medical harm. That was followed up a number of years later by an AHRQ, an Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Action 2 task order, which allowed the piloting, creation, and finally the rollout of the CANDOR toolkit, which is available to everybody in the public. MedStar Health, Dignity Health, and Christiana Care Hospitals were actively involved in that important development work. So I'll stop here and let the panel take it over, but we have a video clip, a short one, we'd like to start off with. So Donna, would you play that video for us? Sure will. 
This is the call that started it all. Mom fell and I think she broke her hip. The ambulance is on the way. When my mom went into the hospital for a routine partial hip replacement. He knew something was wrong. The neurologist told us, your mom is in a coma. And now it's brutally clear. I need a lawyer. We have not even begun to recognize the country's third leading cause of death, medical care gone wrong. The medical profession needs to be accountable for the errors. These are our costs, $421,000. Meds, health insurance, taxes, all roads lead to the insurance company. Their whole plan is to drag this out as long as they can. You're a lawyer, am I correct? No, I'm a comedy director. This is taking over our lives. Problems in healthcare continue to be endemic. We're not learning from our mistakes. Something has to change so this doesn't keep happening to people. This is the call. Apologies. Uh, Dave, would you like to, uh, or would you like to uh, introduce or have the, the panelists introduce themselves a bit? Oh, you're, you're muted, Dave. Yeah, thanks, David. That would be great. Let's start with Steve as he will kick off uh, our presentations before we get into the Q&A. All right. Um, my name is Steve Burroughs. I'm uh, the writer-director of the HBO documentary Bleed Out. Thank you so much for um, being here today, and, and thanks to the candor and folks for playing our, our HBO trailer. Um, basically, uh, the film is about when my mom went in for a routine partial hip replacement, came out in a coma with permanent brain damage, and our world just kind of stopped. And I'm here today to support these incredible speakers, but also uh, give my uh, point of view on when, when something goes wrong, what does this uh, deny and defend and look and feel like for patients and families like ours? And I can tell you that in our case, uh, with my mom, certainly as it's depicted in the film Bleed Out uh, over 10 years, we experienced this, this insidious deny and defend tactic uh, twice, once medically, and then all over again legally. And uh, I would actually like to add the word today, we could delay, delay defend and deny. Uh, with regards to the truth and what happened, we were trying to figure out what happened. Uh, we, we, went, we experienced this incredible delay of the proceedings for as long as possible. Uh, particularly the legal proceedings. They would defend uh, their position to the death and they would deny any wrongdoing at all costs whatsoever. Uh, there's a sequence actually in our film where I actually recorded all of the depositions uh, at trial of all of the doctors and all the caregivers that were in our case. And there's a sequence where they don't recall. They're asked questions about what happened and they don't recall. Uh, I don't recall. I don't recall. And it's as if... Uh, uh, having this routine hip surgery patient falling into a coma happens every day for these folks. Completely forgettable event, I don't recall it. It still irks me to no end when, when we screen that portion of the film. Um, what does delay, defend, and deny look feel like to us? Uh, certainly in our case, in our experience, it feels like 10 years, literally a decade. Um, when this happened back in 2009 to my mother, my mom uh, came out cognitively and physically disabled due to permanent brain damage. She lost her home, her car, her independence. Uh, she had saved 50 years of her life savings and that was gone in less than three years of pain for the injuries inflicted upon her. And for those of you who don't know, uh, my mom actually lost her life last year as well due to these injuries. Um, and then it has this, this ripple effect as well for our family. Um, and in our case, in caring for my mother for those 10 years and in seeking justice for her, we went through a seven year litigation. Um, my family and I, my, my wife and I in particular, um, uh, we, we lost our jobs, we lost our careers, uh, we lost our income, uh, we lost our health insurance, and uh, we recently lost our house. And I, I don't say that as woe as me, I, I say that as a cautionary tale to let people know that this is not pretty, this is brutal. And it's all because of the, uh, there was no accountability or transparency or apology or ownership or any restitution at, at, at any point in this entire uh, uh, situation with my mother, even to this day. And um, one of the things I think uh, Dave may talk about this a little later, but 
the, the, the concept of intentional harm versus unintentional harm. Uh, we all know that that first harm, whatever happens, is never intentional. No doctor or nurse gets up and says, hey, I think I'm going to go cut off the wrong leg today. Um, that doesn't happen. But it's the second, the third, and the fourth harms. That, you know, in, in our case, certainly, the lies and the deceit and the cover-up. We had falsification of records and surgery. These are intentional acts. And I, I say this truly in my humble opinion. These harms are the most devastating harms for families like ours. Uh, the ones that cause the most long-term pain and suffering. This is damage that, you know, in our case has, has, has not gone away mentally, uh, physically, emotionally. Um, so we know that when something goes wrong in medicine, whether it's medical malpractice or negligence or mistakes or adverse events or preventable mishaps, whatever you want to call it. And we, we all know that not all uh, uh, negligence is medical malpractice. We, not all, we know not all mistakes are negligence. But when something goes wrong, uh, there's this moment of truth. You know, I've seen it, I've, I've talked to now thousands of people in, who have been in our shoes that I didn't even know existed. And when something goes wrong for these doctors and nurses and hospitals, there's this moment of truth. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna do the right thing or are you not gonna do the right thing? And a lot of it depends on the culture of the hospital. A lot of it depends on the individual. Uh, but if you don't do the right thing, I can promise you that that event causes this caustic, destructive ripple effect that continues to just like expand and expand and it, and, and it helps nobody. It doesn't help the families, it doesn't help the patients, it doesn't help the doctors and nurses, and by the way, their families. I think about this all the time, you know, the doctors who were involved in my case. They have families and children and grandchildren too. Everyone was traumatized by this. Nobody learns anything. No healing occurs. It's like this disease that just keeps feeding on itself. Nothing is better. Or uh, if you're like the Jack Gentry story, which you'll see in a little bit, this can be a life-affirming, life-changing event that really helps injured patients and their families and the doctors and the nurses and the hospitals that are all affiliated with this. Lessons can be learned. Healthcare gets better just because you do the right thing. You just are honest about it. You know, we're all human beings. We all make mistakes. It happens in the medical community. Mistakes are going to happen. Uh, I think the big question that Bleed Out asks, I didn't even realize it took me like, you know, years to even figure out what my movie was about. But in the end, I think it's about what happens when mistakes are made. You know, what are you going to do? And the great Jack Gentry, I'm sorry, you can't be here today. Uh, I saw him uh, a year ago and he told me that, uh, my mom's story and, and Jack's story are opposite sides of the same coin. And you folks are going to have to tell me which one works better. Our experience is delay, deny, and defend works short-term for one side. And long-term, it slowly eats away at both sides. Uh, this, this, this shouldn't be a, a us or them thing. It should be a we thing. And I, I thank God for candor. And I, I thank, I, I'm so grateful to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, for sharing that story. And, and you know, uh, we got to know your mother before she did pass away. And, and um, you know, the legacy you are leaving for her and, and you and Margo, your wife, is just amazing. And for those of you who haven't seen that HBO award-winning documentary film, you have to watch it. It really describes um, what we're trying to accomplish here, not only in this webinar, but through the great work you'll hear of others on the panel today. So I'd like to turn it over now to Tom Gallagher. Uh, Tom is professor and associate chair at the Department of Medicine, as well as the professor in the Department of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Tom has led more scholarly work on candor and communication optimal resolution type programs than anyone I have ever met. His ongoing contributions to this area continue to raise the importance of open and honest communication after medical harm. And Tom, it's an honor to have you with us today. Dave, thank you so much. And it's great to be with everybody. Uh, I love the Midwest. We spent about 10 years there. Uh, I'm actually at the other UW, uh, the University of, of Washington. And uh, my uh, hopefully my Husky uh, background uh, uh, reminds folks of uh, where we are in Seattle. 
Um, and thank you so much, Steve, for uh, uh, sharing, uh, you know, just a really horrible experience for you and your family and your mom. You're right that this culture of delay and deny and defend when mistakes happen just exacerbates the suffering of patients and families. Uh, but it also is, I think, the number one reason that we've struggled to improve the quality and safety of healthcare because when something goes wrong, we're not open, we're not honest, we're not learning. On the next slide, we depict even for organizations and clinicians who really want to be open and honest, they struggle with how to do this. Here's a doctor who's decided to come out of the operating room and, and takes the musical approach, uh, singing, uh, listen up my fine people, I'll sing you a song about a brave neurosurgeon who done something wrong. Well, this is not the approach we would recommend that you take, um, um, but it just shows how awkward and uncomfortable these conversations can be. And if we don't train clinicians to handle them effectively, it just takes a bad situation and makes it so much worse. Well, you've heard about CANDOR. CANDOR is an example, a type of communication and resolution program. What's a communication and resolution program? On the next slide, we describe the different elements. And this is if I send you a, a, a chat um, on the webinar and ask you what's a communication and resolution program, here's the answer. They're principled, they're comprehensive, they're systematic programs for both preventing and responding to harm events. And they have multiple elements, early incident reporting, open and ongoing communication with the patient and family, really thoughtful event analysis and quality improvement for those harm events where the, uh, an error or system failure has occurred, making a proactive offer of financial compensation rather than forcing patients and families to go through the court system. Care for the caregiver is critical and, and patient and family involvement throughout. And all of these elements need to be hardwired to work effectively together. A lot of organizations have each of these pieces, but they don't use them systematically each and every time there's a harm event and they don't use the whole model and the pieces don't work well together. The benefits of an effective communication and resolution program are described on the next slide and they're multiple. First and foremost, this is about supporting patients and families who have been harmed by their care. It provides empathic and ongoing communication, connections to learning. In our research, we know that this is just critical to patients and families that there be learning and financial and non-financial resolution. But it's also something that supports clinicians and others at the organization. Having been involved in high harm events myself as a clinician, I can tell you most often, we just put our heads down and move on to the next patient. It's not helpful for the clinicians. <clears throat> I doubt you would wanna be the next patient that we rounded on. But ultimately, Communication and resolution programs are really about driving a culture of accountability and learning at an organization, thereby improving patient, family, and clinician trust. And in the aggregate, there's a happy secondary benefit of reducing medical legal expenses. But those, those organizations that use a CRP primarily as a risk or a claims management tool are not likely to reap all of the benefits. I've been pleased to contribute to a growing evidence base around communication and resolution programs and that's summarized on the next slide. You can see that it's clear that CRPs contain the key elements that patients and families expect in the response to harm, both quantitative, qualitative, as well as anecdotal information supports that claim. CRPs can improve medical legal expenses and don't worsen them. That's clear from a variety of studies. Qualitative research suggests that these promote patient and family trust, they support clinicians, they enhance quality, and they drive a culture of healthcare accountability. And we, uh, as the evidence base grows, I uh, am confident there will be quantitative research to support that claim as well. And one of the reasons I'm so optimistic about the field, on the next slide, we highlight this is work that's not only being taken up by healthcare organizations, but multiple liability insurers 
who as Steve mentioned is are often the ones behind the deny and defend mentality are, the, are recognizing this is a key way to move forward. The Beta Healthcare Group, a large liability insurer in California that we work with, um, has an outstanding CRP called HEART. Uh, it's a very rigorous and systematic process. Constellation Mutual, a uh, liability insurer in the Midwest, recently launched a communication and resolution program they call HEAL. And these are just two examples um, of the insurers really coming to the table and wanting to be supportive and constructive partners um, in this work. Um, so when you look across the field on the next slide, what we see is that uptake of communication and resolution programs is increasing dramatically. We estimate between four and 500 healthcare organizations and insurers have a CRP or are working in this direction, which is great. But the big challenge that the field is experiencing is one of inconsistent implementation, using this sometimes and not others, using this approach, some elements, but not the whole approach for an individual case. And the reason that this inconsistent implementation is so toxic is that it just give, gives fuel to the skeptics who thinks these are really kind of claims management programs dressed up in patient-centered rhetoric. So to really meet the patient and family-centered objective that drives a CRP, we need to use, learn how to implement them much, much more systematically. Well, on the next slide, I, I highlight how, you know, in, at times um, the deny, delay, defend response it is an intentional conscious choice, but there's also a lot of subconscious unintended um, um, action at play here when something goes wrong. Because think about times when you've been involved in something going wrong. We all have this normal human tendency to want to keep uncomfortable information to ourselves and rationalize and minimize. It doesn't come naturally because organizations send all sorts of mixed messages. We want you to tell the patient and family what happened, but don't say that. And the nervous clinician isn't sure what to do. The status quo and inertia show down the pro progress. There are some cases which are clear cut errors, but lots of cases that involve gray areas. And then until the release of the Candor toolkit um, um, and more tool development, there really haven't been a lot of tools and resources out there that help organizations know, well, what exactly are we supposed to do? How well are we currently doing and what can we do to improve? Um, and uh, the next slide just sort of highlights again how this inconsistent implementation impacts patients and families. And this is a silly cartoon of the false apology card organizations saying, well, we'll apologize to the patient. And they say, I'm sorry you feel that way. Uh, I'm sorry you experienced this problem. Uh, uh, I'm sorry that you got mad, right? There are all sorts of ways that organizations can say, well, I apologized and really not meet the needs of patients and families. So how do we do this consistently? On the next slide, we highlight all of the work that's going on in three domains that are really critical to consistent high fidelity CRP implementation. We need tools and metrics um, to help organizations know how are we doing with our CRP process. We need standard work that's been designed and launched. And then we need to apply uh, implementation and process improvement tools to the CRP process. Actually, in some respects, this should come naturally because at many organizations, CRP implementation lives largely in the quality and safety space where they're used to using these tools for everything but their CRP. And we hope that that um, will change. Um, so one of the examples of ways that the field is working to change is highlighted on the next slide, an action network that uh, we are standing up in partnership with our colleagues in Boston at Ariadne Labs and with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, it will help organizations design and implement a variety of new tools and measures, use a variety of digital platforms to help them and really bring together organizations that are wanting to learn and improve in this area. 
So in summary, the deny and delay and defend approach that caused such horrible damage to Steve and his family uh, uh, is not the way we should be approaching uh, uh, harm events and mistakes in healthcare. Communication and resolution programs are these comprehensive, principled and systematic programs for both preventing and responding to harm events. The increased uptake is great, but the inconsistent implementation is concerning. And we uh, look forward to working with as many of you as possible on rolling out the tools, the measures, uh, the standard work, the other strategies to make sure each and every time harm events happen, this is the approach that's taken. Uh, thanks so much. And I look forward to the comments of the rest of the panelists. Thanks, Tom. Um, are you sure I can't get you to University of Wisconsin? Uh, what a great, what a great, what a great, yeah, yeah, what a great place, a great institution. And uh, uh, I came from, as you know, Washington University was where I was previously. So that yeah. just maximized everybody's confusion. Well, I see you have dub and my mental model wants to go to my oldest daughter's alma mater in Wisconsin. So uh, my apologies, but I know, I know you're there. Okay, next panelist, we're excited to introduce Carol Hemmelgarn. She will humbly tell you she is a patient safety advocate and leave the rest out. But I could tell you, Carol is a patient safety communication and ethics specialist. She is an instructor and curricular development advisor for uh, not only MedStar and Georgetown's universities, executive masters in quality and safety leadership, but also at the University of Illinois in Chicago's master's program in quality and safety leadership. And she has really been instrumental in helping lead the creation of candor legislation in her home state of Colorado. So Carol, we welcome you to the panel. Thank you. Many people ask patient advocates, family members, why we get involved in this work. And it's not because we want the theme that you will hear from any harmed patient or family member is that we want to make sure what happened to us and our loved ones doesn't happen to anyone else. And if you go when you look at the literature, there's four things that patients and families want after harm. The first is tell us what happened. And when we say that, it's not what you all as providers and organizations feel comfortable telling us or think we ought to know, it's what we wanna know. The second one is take responsibility. You see, we carry this immense guilt and burden that we did not do enough to protect ourselves as patients or our loved ones. The third is what I believe are the two most powerful words in the English language, I'm sorry. Apologize, as Tom said, but apologize sincerely, because if you're not, it's just another intentional harm. And the fourth one is tell us how you're going to fix the problem. We need to know that what happened to us, our loved ones, wasn't taken in vain. But there's a fifth one that is not talked a lot about in the literature, and that is involving patients and families and how to fix these problems. And that's what I really want to focus on today is that Tom talked about, you know, what can organizations and providers do, but what is the role of patients and families in this space? You've been sitting here looking at the picture of my nine-year-old daughter, Alyssa. Alyssa died because of multiple medical errors, and it took the organization where she died three years, seven months, and 28 days to have the first honest conversation with me. And how do I know all those days? Because every morning I got up and I walked into her empty bedroom and I started my day by apologizing to her for not being a better mother and protecting her. This is no way to treat patients and families after harm. I still don't have answers to what happened to my daughter and I probably never will. And she is the passion that drives me to do this work. One of the things I've learned is that grief and gratitude can coexist. 
And that's what we have to understand in when it comes to transparency and disclosure and honest communications. So I want you all on the call to understand where do patients and families fit in this work? Well, we usually start by sharing our stories because that's in a way to bring awareness to the problems. But then many of us start to realize we can also teach that we can take our skill set and share about why communication is important and transparency. And then many move on to education where the story becomes less and less. And it's more about organizations understanding more bias and perception and cognitive diagnoses play in to these errors. Oftentimes then people realize that they wanna get involved in committees sepsis committees, adverse drug events, patient safety committees. Then many move up to the board level or do work with like the collaborative. I'm fortunate to be on the collaborative board with Tom and realize that I can have a bigger impact at a larger scale. Then many jump into policy. As Dave mentioned, I happen to live in Colorado and Copic is the liability insurance here for many and for many other states. And they reached out to me when they started to want to build legislation, candor legislation like Iowa did. And they wanted to make sure the patient and family voice was as represented as the provider voice. And we got legislation passed. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But our goal is to make those conversations better and easier to have. And it's that the next state and the next state build upon it and make it better. It has been 20 years since the IOM report, and there have been some great things done in healthcare, but there's been a lot that hasn't been covered. And one of the main reasons is patients and families have the most skin in the game and we only have a seat at the table some of the time. If we want healthcare to be more reliable, innovative, and safer, patients and families have to have a seat at the table 24 seven, seven days a week. And we have to have a name tag because it was once said by so many people, nothing about us without us. The catalyst for change in healthcare is patients and families. Marty, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Carol, and hello, everybody. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Oh, we're gonna do we're gonna do Jack now. Uh, so this is the case study that uh, Steve mentioned earlier uh, of candor in action. Um, the patient here is Jack Gentry, whose face you see here. We're about to see a clip, and you'll see his story. Uh, Jack experienced a, a harm event at uh, MedStar Hospital. Uh, MedStar, as Dave mentioned, was one of the organizations that was uh, um, involved very early in implementing CANDOR. And, uh, and so the infrastructure was there, the leadership was there, um, they were ready to go. And uh, here's the story. I lived an active life um, with backpacking and camping with my wife and, and my children. Um, I played um, a lot of sports and coached uh, baseball for 11 years. I joined the police department in 1975. And um, the last 17 years of my 37 year career, um, I spent with the SWAT team I've always used to preach to my guys in SWAT that it's a adapt and overcome. In the summer of 2013, I began to experience um, a shooting pain in my right arm. Dr. Torlani recommended uh, surgery, and he explained that there were two ways to do it. One was to to fuse um, the disc, um, but there was a second method was um, 
relatively new, uh, but he had done it successfully, and that was to replace one uh, disc with an artificial disc and then fuse the second um, disc. While I was sitting there waiting, the attendant asked me to go to a back room and take the phone with me. And I was thinking, oh, he's finished. He just wants to tell me that they're done and he's moving on. And instead it turned out that he said things weren't going very well. One of the instruments that he was using malfunctioned and um, struck my spinal cord. I learned that I was paralyzed from the neck down. Dr. Tortolani did come out and sat down and talked to me and explained to me what was going on. He went way beyond apologizing. I could tell for him it was very hard because he had known Jack for a while. I had always been a, a fighter and I told him, I said, let's get the show on the road. Let's figure out what we're gonna do and get it started. I don't remember exactly when I got the call from the risk manager who's on site at the local hospital. But when he called me, the question was, um, how do we deal with this? What should we do? When you work in an organization where the directive is to do the right thing, the answers are really easy. Tell them basically anything they need is what we're here to give them. We have to support them. I was shocked personally that the hospital did say something happened on our watch. We want to be responsible for it and we want to help you in any way we can. I went in the hospital as a patient and then I became a victim. And that's not right. As a victim, the early intervention allows the victim slash patient to get on with their life a little quicker. If we're there in the very beginning, we can make sure they have home health aid, they have somebody in the house to take care of them, they have attendants if they need to, somebody to take care of their needs. In the old traditional way, I'm just looking at picking up the pieces after everything has been broken. In the new way, we're looking at taking those pieces and making sure they're melded together to get the patient the best outcome possible. MedStar did it all. They did emotional support, they did physical support, and they did monetary support. I think all of those things together are what's gonna make it a success. It was one less thing I had to worry about. It allowed me to concentrate on getting better. That just made life a lot easier for me. I didn't really uh, introduce myself before. I am Marty Hatley, and um, I serve as the co-director of the MedStar Institute for Quality and Safety. Uh, and I also serve as the CEO of an organization in Chicago called Project Patient Care that's done a lot of work with uh, CMS on um, patient safety and, and candor. So um, Tom mentioned already just the, the speed the, uh, in which candor is being taken up in the country. And it's happening in different areas in different markets, if you will. So for example, in California, there are large systems and the university system and smaller hospitals that are almost creating the market. Um, he mentioned Beta Healthcare, you see their banner in the lower light, uh, right hand um, part of this slide. I mean, they gave premium discounts to physicians and hospitals and hospital systems that would go th through um, candor training or what they call beta training, their beta heart program, which is a, a version of CRP that they've branded themselves. And so the, that market has really taken off and it's spreading. And it's spreading as the evidence accumulates that um, this does not cost more to hospitals and it permits them to do a lot of healing and a lot of things that um, not only take care of their patients and sort of earn the trust of their patients uh, by respecting them and being honest and transparent with them, but it also takes care of their caregiver. So it's exciting to see that. Um, he also talked about liability insurers and other places stepping up and um, mentioned Constellation, but the other one to note is um, Copic in Colorado. Copic was involved in uh, supporting uh, um, candor type programs, CRP type programs in Colorado and in Iowa. Both of those states now have legislation passed that create kind of a safe space or a safer space for conversations that happen in the immediate aftermath of a catastrophic event uh, to go forward in a, 
a, a space of trust where you don't have to worry about what is said in those conversations, whether you're the plaintiff or the defendant, potential plaintiff or potential defendant, I should say, um, um, coming back to bite you in a court of law. And we've heard from both um, family members and patients and providers that they're just nervous about having those conversations unless they have uh, some assurance that there's going to, um, that it's not going to be used against them later. So seeing the liability insurers step up in that way is really um, significant, I think, and we're seeing more and more. The liability insurers were just not at all on board three or four years ago. It's a sign of change. The other thing that I think is a major dynamic is what Carol spoke about, and that is the engagement of uh, patients and families in this work being part of the training. Um, Carol herself has been just instrumental here. You see, it's not a great picture of you, Carol, but in the lower left-hand slide, you see Carol presenting to a group of, of residents and uh, people in Colorado. Carol does a terrific amount of training, as Dave mentioned. In the upper left-hand corner, in the sort of top left-hand side, you see Barbara and Bob Malizo. I mean, they were so prolific out on the circuit talking about the importance of this to their family that I bet many people on this phone call have heard them speak before. Um, the picture at the top with the little uh, cursor in the middle is Bob, Barb, and Tim McDonald, who in many ways has been the thought leader for all of us in this work, presenting at CMS in 2011. And that went viral. I mean, that went everywhere. They had so many invitations to have to come and, and be part of motivation and not just motivation, but creating the space of empathy where we can have we can have we can understand each other's sides and each other's positions in this as we go forward. Um, I also wanted to point out the picture in the middle. That's Jack's wife Teresa. You saw her a little bit in the last video, but we were presenting on a system in Minnesota, a small system in rural Minnesota, that felt that candor was really needed for their culture because they had had some events that just were completely traumatizing to the system. Jack and Teresa came out to speak and of course had to visit the Mary Tyler Moore statue in Minneapolis and just kind of toss our hats in the air to <laughs> celebrate the fact that we were transforming. Um, the other picture I want to point out here is just to the left of that, at least on my screen, and that is uh, a presentation that we did at Vizient at their major conference in 2019. And you see Jack and Teresa there along with Vizient leaders. At that presentation, which was very condensed in time, Jack said, it took me a lot to get out here because it's not easy for Jack to fly. If I reached one person in this audience today, I would have done my job. And I'm happy to say we've heard from people um, later who, who said, I walked away from that talk and came back to my organization thinking differently, thinking about my job differently, thinking about my organization's mission differently. So there's a lot of vectors that are, uh, that are in place now really driving um, this forward, including you know, the kind of research that Tom is, um, and metric development that Tom's collaborative is doing uh, that just keeps generating the evidence that this paradigm shift is not only um, the right thing to do, but the better thing to do from you know, a number of different points of view, cost savings, earning trust, um, you know, being the organization that you want to be and treating your patients the way you'd want to be treated if, uh, if you were a patient. And it's interesting to see how uh, candor will be impacted by um, COVID because we suddenly have a lot of providers who are now patients themselves. So we're thinking about patient safety really as this place of empathy. I'll stop there, but that's kind of uh, my contribution to where, we, where we're going from here. It's, it's great to see this momentum. Thanks, Marty. Um... You know, appreciate you sharing those, all those great stories. I don't know if many people on the call realize that Marty Hatley was there 25 years ago. I mean, before the IOM report, he and two others organized the first Annenberg Center on patient safety that got national publicity and, and really started this movement. So Marty, thank you for your 25 years of supporting patients and family members. Uh, we've got a lot of great questions that have come in. I've been watching the chats, chat room also. Thank you for your comments. But I think the first question uh, I'll, I'll give to Tom because it relates to in the candor reporting requirements and mechanisms, are hospitals required to report to the National Practitioner Data Bank or to their state medical boards when they see maybe something egregious that happened and caused harm? 
So there's a lot that federal and state regulators can do to support the advancement of communication and resolution program. And <clears throat> Marty mentioned two of the states, uh, Colorado and Iowa, which have passed enabling legislation. There's enabling legislation in Massachusetts, and then Oregon also has state legislation around their, uh, their early intervention program. And that type of work is great, um, but there are some policy barriers um, at both the federal and the state level um, that I think slow this work down. Um, one is the requirement around reporting to the National Practitioner Data Bank. The National Practitioner Data Bank re requires reporting when a malpractice claim is paid in response to a written demand and on behalf of a named provider. Uh, uh, and many states uh, also, their medical boards have requirements for reporting paid malpractice claims. In, in, in theory, that might make sense as a signal that there was a quality of care problem or concern about provider competence. Um, but very, very few candor cases actually involve concerns about provider competence. And physicians really worry about sort of the black mark of a data bank report or even more so a State Board of Medicine investigation um, against them. And so trying to realign um, some of these reporting requirements um, with kind of what we understand about patient safety um, and support for candor programs, I do think would remove a, a, a barrier that um, slows this work down both at the federal and the state level. They're also required to, Dave, report, as you know, um, action against doctors' privileges at hospitals, which is, I think, a strong marker of quality and safety. Um, um, and I hope that this work over time leads to enhancements in the peer review process, because um, that would be another way that um, candor-related activities could drive quality and safety. No, thanks, Tom. Great points. And, and yes, you know, when we look at some of the best work done in fair and just culture work, whether it's James Reasons or, or others, Sidney Decker always says that the balance in a just culture is supporting the science of safety, but also holding those accountable who practice recklessly and put patients at known risk for their own benefits. So it is really that balance and we need to be accountable when those things happen. Another question here, I'd like to reach out to Steve Burroughs for this one. Steve, it's a question related to informed consent. And I know you had a lot of issues that you went through with your mother in regards to a lack of informed consent, as well as some of the comments we've had and conversations you and I have had about death certificates being totally void about, you know, preventable medical harm as a cause. Uh, could you address those questions, Steve? Steve, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thanks, Dave. Yeah, there's a whole section in our film Bleed Out about the informed consent thing. Um, you know, my mom uh, came out of a coma. She had permanent cognitive physical disabilities, and she was ruled incompetent, and yet... Uh, this hospital system in Wisconsin had her signing her informed consent for seven years. And I would go into the hospital with her and I would say, um, is, there any, is there anything in her chart that says she has an activated power of attorney, that she is incompetent? And they're like, they couldn't, you know, there was this, and I actually filmed all this stuff and this hospital system could not, they could not, the right hand did not know what the left hand was doing. And it was, it, was, it was shocking because I was all over this thing. And then I started to think about the other people who, uh, you know, what about the other patients that have activated power attorneys or have people who need help? Uh, there, there was nothing in the records that my mom had actually suffered permanent brain damage at this hospital and was incompetent. It was shocking. And they said they would get on it. Um, and uh, they told me that they would... Uh, do a, what do they call a, the root cause analysis thing, you know, where they would get to the bottom of it and we're, you know, we're, we're going to either thank you for pointing this out and Steve, uh, we're going to get to the bottom. We'll get back in two weeks. And that was, that was six years ago, still waiting for the call, not coming. And then the other question Dave was. And the death certificates being totally void of, 
um, you know, preventable medical harm being the cause of death. Right. We just had a unique situation where my mom's original cause of death, she died a, a year ago, almost exactly. And uh, her physician put in natural causes. And we knew that that wasn't correct. But, you know, you can't fight City Hall. And um, I was so burned out and so sad at the moment. But my funeral director, of all people, decided, no, no, this is not correct. And she took a stand and actually went to the uh, notified the Wisconsin uh, State uh, Medical Examiner's Board and said, you've got to watch bleed out because this is not right. They did the requisition to all the records from the hospital. And they uh, did something that I'm told is incredibly rare. They literally changed the record of her cause of death from natural causes to accidental death uh, due to complications of hip surgery due to medical error, which is, I was told, does not happen. Uh, but it happened in our case, thank goodness, for a lovely funeral director. I would, I could hug her right now. But it's, yeah, that's a whole nother, that's probably a whole nother film, the informed consent and the death certificate thing. Yeah. But I'll let somebody else make that. Thanks, Steve. You know, a question directed at uh, Carol. Um, Carol, it seems like in certain hospitals, the uh, questionnaire was asking, you have places where they want to embrace candor and, and the doctors, the nurses want to do the right thing, but it's hospital leadership or more, you know, often it's risk management that shuts the process down. Uh, I'd like to hear your experience and thoughts related to those issues. Yeah, as I was saying, you know, so much of this starts with leadership. You have to have um, your board of directors, you have to have your leadership that say, we're going to do the right thing. And under that, that has to follow your claims department. It has to follow your legal team. Uh, I can tell you in the organization where my daughter died until there was a CEO change, until risk management changed, until legal change, we weren't having any conversations. Um, and so it, it really is, um, it's interesting because I know Tracy who posed this question in the work that I've done with Copic. So liability insurer, one of their biggest barriers was their own claims department and having to work with their claims department to say, this is what we're doing. This is how we used to do it, but you have to think different. So it, it has to trickle down and you have to have all the players from the leadership to the mid-level Everyone is aligned that this is the mission and we are going to be honest and transparent. And this is what we do as an organization. So you can't have one level doing it and it's not at all levels. Um, and that's where you have to have those checks and balances. So thanks for the question, Tracy. It, it's, you know, it's not an easy process. Marty, I'd like to get your thoughts on that one too, because we've gotten a few questions about it does start with leadership. And I know a lot of times when you go into an organization, you're doing a readiness assessment or gap analysis with Tim and others when uh, rolling the program out. Could you talk, I know you're on mute, but could you talk and, and let us know um, what you've seen as you've gone across the country and dealt with CEOs in the C-suite? Well, we've learned, uh, I guess, at the most basic level that unless your uh, senior leadership and your governance is in, is in support of this and fully in support of this and not just posing, as Tim would say, not just, you know, checking the box and saying, oh, yeah, we feel great about candor or CRP. It's got to, you got to walk the talk. It fails. You, you might implement, but it's not going to get sustained because your culture isn't going to believe it's real until you demonstrate, your leadership demonstrates that it's real. What we've seen kind of beyond that basic finding is that when you implement candor in an organization, it opens up the conversation about the trust issues within the organization. There's still, you know, 25 years after, you know, moving beyond blame became kind of the first banner cry of the patient safety movement. There's still a, a truckload of blame uh, that attaches to people in organizations. And there's a lot of fear about it. Um, a lot of, as it gets, I think it's socialized in a number of ways. So um, the implementation through an assessment process gives people permission to talk about the things that they've done that they might feel, you know, uh, weren't the standard of care, but also the things that they've seen other people do that they're afraid to speak up and talk about, or the policies that they think don't work, or the ways in which people are treated, the bullying that they see. 
or um, the passive aggressive behaviors. So the candor process really opens that empathy space, which I talked about. Um, and Dave, I wanna just comment quickly too on Lisa McGifford's comment too about secrecy being important, being the problem. And I think this is a leadership issue as well. I mean, if you're really gonna implement candor, you have to make a commitment to be transparent with patients and families. You've gotta tell them everything. You've gotta, you know, there's no, there's no hiding there. But when it comes to the different regulatory mechanisms and identifying the people involved in a multimodal, uh, you know, failure in an organization, if unless there's some better trust that we have in our systems for holding people accountable, I think this, the strong leaders are saying, you know what, we're going to tell the family, patient family everything, but we're not going to put the names of the nurses and the doctors um, out in the press or out in other places like that because. Uh, that will undo everything we're trying to do internally in our culture to create to create a just culture and a culture of trust. So it's a kind of a nuanced answer to your concern, Lisa, but I really think it needs to be said. I mean, complete transparency with patients and families, and then think about your culture uh, and the trust that you want to engender, because without trust, candor and CRP just won't work. Long answer, Dave. Sorry to take all the time. No, it, it, it's great conversations. Look, we've got some great comments in the chat room and tons of questions. It's really exciting to see. I, I know Irene's been talking about, you know, that advocates need to get involved before harm occurs. And, and that is such an important concept. You've heard people refer to primary, secondary, and tertiary, you know, safety. And, and we're, Candor focuses on tertiary. We need to back the system up so we never have to get into a candor-like model. Again, if we could move to primary and secondary prevention maneuvers and everything. You know, I, I think we've got time for about one more question and I'll open it up to the whole uh, panel. Uh, the question came in uh, specifically, uh, okay, candor's nice. People are, are trying to roll it out at different levels. Some have had success. Some are still at the beginning of the journey. Why not legislation? Why not regulations that say everybody needs to come up to this level? And I understand the issues about getting legislation passed, but could you talk about what are next steps that when we finally stop getting this being done for the right reasons, how do we bring everybody up to the same level? Tom, you want to start first? Well, I would welcome, for example, CMS, um, including um, CRP related elements in their conditions of participation. Um, I think that would be a, a welcome change. Um, um, but I think because of some of the sort of the nervousness and anxiety uh, and aspects of the medico legal environment that are suboptimal that Marty was referencing, uh, until those can be addressed, I think we will make faster progress um, encouraging organizations to adopt these voluntarily, developing measures of who's doing a good job, and then broadcasting and rewarding people for having high functioning CRPs, um, rather than making this a requirement that you know, organizations could essentially check the box and meet. Um, um, so I, I hope it's a little bit of a top down, but mostly a bottom up um, um, and then celebrating successes approach. I'd like to pile on to Tom with that too. I think regulation is the way to go. I, I'm thinking about the legislation that was introduced in, in Maryland that didn't pass, uh, despite Jack Gentry and his brothers, you know, very uh, vocal uh, advocacy. And it's because the plaintiff's bar essentially said, we're not comfortable having any conversation happen with a, with a family member, even if it's in the middle of an event without us being there. And you can't get a lawyer to the, you know, the, the middle of an event or the immediate aftermath of an event when you're trying to open up that level of communication and honesty and trust. So you've got to work through those things. And I think regulation, you know, thoughtful regulations built on some of the metrics that we're seeing uh, is, is the faster, uh, way to implement. I also think leaders really need to be championing this in their communities. I mean, there's things that you can do to grow a culture of trust in a community. I mean, Julie Morath is a great example of that. When she was basically gone after by the Minneapolis Star Tribune because she wouldn't disclose the names of doctors and nurses involved in candor events, she went to the press 
And she started talking about um, just culture and what they were trying to inculcate at Children's Hospital in Minneapolis. So you can do some things in the public sector that aren't necessarily legislation. Dave, you're muted, I think. No, I should be okay. Um, so I, yeah. I want to add one comment, Dave, um, just, you know, because I know we're winding up and you know I say this often, is healthcare providers, hospitals, organizations need to understand the conversation doesn't end until the patient or family sends it, says that it ends. So even though we go through this, you may think you have this conversation once and it's done. We have to find a space and a place in our heart and our head to put this. So the conversation is over when the patient and family doesn't come back anymore and has no more questions. Yeah, thanks, Carol. It's always a Great summation. Uh, Steve, any last comments before we turn it back to Donna and, and thank everybody? Well, uh, first off, I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate being included in this, this stellar group. Uh, I think my mom, um, she would be so proud to know that her story is being embraced by folks like you and that it's making a difference. I can tell you one little piece of good news that uh, we've had recently uh, is that the uh, the, the new CEO of the, uh, the hospital system where my mom was injured, they merged. There was, I, 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 I say names all the time. There was, my mom was injured at a place called Aurora and there's one called Advocate Illinois. They just merged. It's called Advocate Aurora. And it was radio silence for 12 years uh, until just recently. I, I had the CEO reach out to me uh, and he's trying, uh, he and his team have, uh, uh, folks, we just had a conversation last week. It was our, our second conversation. And we're trying to figure out a way to move forward in some meaningful way because they've now seen uh, the impact of my mom's story. And also that I partnered up with some pretty great people in the patient safety movement. So, I'm, you know, uh, I've got this uh, incredible group of people who are continue to push the story and have been doing it for all these years prior to us coming along. And I think that they're, they're finding it hard to um, ignore us anymore. So I'm, as I would normally, most people would say I'm cautiously uh, optimistic. I'm actually cautiously pessimistic that we're actually talking with the uh, CEO. Um, he said he would never lie to me. I take him at his word and I hope that I can share soon some good news that uh, will hopefully help not only all of us on this, on this call, but, um, people in that particular system because, um, uh, boy, we need you. We, we need you folks out there. We really do. I, like I said a million times before, we thought we were alone when this happened. And then when the film came out, we realized that we were not alone. And thank God for all of you. Uh, you guys give me hope. And uh, every time I, I'm on something like this and I hear you guys talking, it just fills up my gas tank. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. And, and thanks to all the panelists. Uh, Donna, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much for moderating this today. This was a fabulous panel today. Uh, we had so many great comments and, and questions. And, and so we'll be sure to, to save all of those and, and look through and see if there's any uh, outstanding questions that we didn't get to. And, and we'll make sure to include that in our recording that we'll post on YouTube. Hopefully we'll have that up uh, within the next day or so. And again, if you are seeking CE credit, you should get an email from MedStar within the next week to, uh, with an evaluation that you'll need to fill out in order to obtain that CE credit. So thank you everyone for joining and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.